today's drawing in the sand. Drawing in the sand. And there's many things we can draw in sand or in dust. And one of the things we can do is uh, we can draw a line. When I was a child and I was in elementary school, we, we played soccer in my school. So we used to draw a line and, and choose teams. And, and, uh, and, and so we had people choosing players for both of the teams. And so we, we had this, this uh, line that we, we draw. And in English uh, language, when we say that someone crosses the line, have you ever uh, told this to someone? When you cross the line, it's because uh, people have started behaving in a way that is not acceptable. Uh, it's like if I, if I was to tell you a, a joke here, sometimes I tell jokes, but I, I need to, to tell acceptable jokes, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was once, the, the worst joke, the, the worst joke I've ever listened to in my life was by a pastor. <laughs> And we were in the pastor's meeting and he told this joke and the joke was so bad that we were about 20 people around the table and everybody stood and we laughed and he stayed laughing at the table. <laughs> and I'll never forget this image. He was alone by himself laughing and laughing and everybody was oops. And uh, we excused ourselves because uh, it was inappropriate. <laughs> and so, so when there's something that's inappropriate, we, we say that people cross a line. So, uh, and uh, we sometimes cross all sorts of lines in our in our lives, and uh, and we we have our own boundaries. And uh, if you draw a line, uh, sometimes it's to it, it's to uh, uh, have a limit between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Now, today I want to mention a few uh, aspects of drawing in the sand. And I'm going to talk about crossing the line in our relationships, crossing the line with God, something you don't want to do. Then we're going to talk about writing in sand, and uh, finally we're going to finish by learn how to draw our own spiritual lines. So uh, let me start by talking about crossing the line in our relationships. And we all have boundaries. Uh, for instance, it, uh, I, I told you, go, go and hug someone. And usually, I don't like to hug people of the opposite sex, except my wife. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I hug her several times a day, but I have a boundary. Uh, I, I don't uh, usually hug someone, uh, because that's my line. I've drawn, uh, I've drawn a, a line in terms of relationships. And also, uh, we draw lines uh, because of respect. And we, we teach our children when they're, they're babies, and we start teaching them how, uh, what is the difference we, between mom and dad and everybody else. I still remember when my, my, uh, my kids started to, to talk, I don't know if it, it, it ever happened to your kids, but they realized that I would call my wife Sarah. So, uh, first time I, I, my, my son, my oldest son, called Sarah, uh, to my wife, uh, it was funny, but uh, my wife told him, I'm not Sarah, to you I'm mom. <laughs> uh, I know that some parents, they, they just allow anything. They say, okay, Sarah, Tony. So we have to teach our kids, I'm not Tony, and she's not Sarah. We are mom and dad. Amen. It's a bit different. So we have to draw a line. And so, and when we, we're teaching kids, we teach these principles of respect. One of the reasons why uh, our education system is failing, it's because the line is not there anymore. And, and because I, I still remember when I was at school, when the teacher entered the class, all the students would stand in silence. We, we all stopped what we were doing, and we had to stand. And if, if one of the kids will stay, you know, uh, doodling at the desk, he will be disciplined for the rest of the day. So we have this line of respect. And we will not address the teacher, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a vulgar way like they do today. So respect can only be maintained if we have boundaries. And in all realms of life, we learn how to interact with others. When I go to the doctor, 
I don't say, hey Natalie, how are you? Give me five. I don't do that. Actually, if I did that to my doctor, some have to say, doctor, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> and I will be in big trouble because uh, uh, we cannot even talk when we go <laughs> to, the, to, to the doctor. But uh, uh, I address her by her title. I say, hello, doctor, how are you? And, and I learned to do this. Uh, when, when I briefly uh, was in the military, I had to learn how to address officers and how to address you know, people with a higher ranking, and uh, because there's boundaries, and, and there's a respect that has to be maintained. I don't, I don't know if you ever went to court, and but if you go to court, when the judge comes in, you better respect the judge. You better respect the judge. If you're driving on the highway at 140, and the police officer stops you, what are you going to say? Hey, how are you? <laughs> No! You start by excusing yourself and you treat him by officer. You, there's a way to address people. And those are social boundaries. If the Prime Minister comes here, I will treat him with the respect that his office deserves. Once I, I, I met uh, our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, and, uh, and it was great to, to meet uh, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister of Canada, but I'm not going to tell him, hi Steve, how are you? <laughs> no, I respect the position. Are you following me? Why am I talking about these things? Because also as Christians, you know, if, if I'm with Stephen Harper and I start to get to know him, and he tells me, okay, skip the, 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 the Prime Minister thing, just call me Steve. It will be hard for me, but I'll accept that. And I'll say, okay, Stephen, he, I'll feel awkward because of this position, but I'll skip the, 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 the line, the boundary. But that's the moment of intimacy. Because if I'm in a public place, even if I have intimacy with the Prime Minister or whoever it is, there's a, a social line that I need to follow. And it's very important. A church, there's also a line that has to be understood. Because it's not that, for instance, a pastor is more important than any of you. I'm not. I'm just one like you. But there's a there's a, a line between being a pastor and being a member of a church. So as a member of a church, I don't have to compare myself with my pastor. Hello? This is so silent now. <laughs> Why am I saying this? It's because if we don't understand social lines, if we don't understand the, the limits and the boundaries, Things don't work. Things don't work. So we need to respect those those boundaries. Amen. And it starts at home. It starts uh, then. Uh, then we learn it at school, and then through life we we learn that if we cross a social line, things can uh, fall apart. Now let me uh, read the Bible verse to you, which is in Mark chapter six, and uh, you know. Uh, Actually, I'm just going to mention the scripture. But the Bible says that Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth. And uh, he said that a prophet is without honor in his hometown. And uh, well, he couldn't do many miracles there, the Bible says. Uh, he did a few miracles. He went outside of town and did a few miracles. But there was a reason why he wasn't able to do miracles. It wasn't because the power of God is limited. But there's spiritual boundaries that can affect even Jesus. Even Jesus. Sometimes we're asking God to do a miracle in our life. And you know what? If we cross the line, if we cross the boundaries, the, 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 the boundaries that are establishing His Word, it's going to be very hard for us to receive anything from the Lord. So we need to know our position. We need to know our boundaries. And uh, we have no evidence that Jesus ever returned to Nazareth after this, this happened. However, he was known by what? Jesus Nazareth. of Nazareth. So, so people labeled him as Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm not going to, uh, you know, to explain why they call him Jesus of Nazareth, but most people of Nazareth had no respect for Jesus. 
He was the son of a carpenter. He wasn't even, uh, you know, uh, Joseph wasn't the father of Jesus, but Jesus was the son of Joseph. So they, they had some respect by, uh, for Joseph, but they didn't respect Jesus. And because they didn't respect Jesus, there were, there were no miracles. They, they weren't able to separate things. They weren't able to honor him as a prophet. He was not going to Nazareth at that point as the Son of God. He was going to Nazareth as a prophet. But they couldn't respect the office. Why? Because they had intimacy with the family and they couldn't accept that Jesus was the Son of God. So it's very important to understand these boundaries. You know, as we celebrate Christmas, Christmas is meaningless for most people. Most people that celebrate Christmas, they couldn't care the less about Jesus or about Christ. They even uh, use the, 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 the letter X instead of Christ. I, I was watching a, an ad on TV uh, that the Knights of Columbus are doing, uh, mocking this, all this situation of Christmas and saying, don't forget that Christ is in Christmas. And it's good that someone has the, the, the financial power to do an ad like this. But we Christians should understand that most people that go to the mall, they wouldn't care less about Jesus, about Christmas, about the birth of the Savior. Why do they do it? Because it's a big celebration. But they've crossed the line of not respecting God or not respecting Jesus or not respecting the things of God. And, uh, and even in our society now, the, the schools in Quebec are not, and the, the office governments are not allowed to have Christmas decorations. Some schools they still do, but, uh, but if you listen to the radio, it's forbidden to have any kind of Christmas decoration in the a, in a, in a Quebec building as of this year. I don't know if you heard the news. So, so uh, why do they do this? Well, I think. Well, we, we, we don't need to put Christmas decoration in the building. To me, it's not a big thing. But it tells me something. It tells me that society doesn't understand who God is. And they don't even understand that when they write a date in an official document, that date refers to the birth of Jesus. Because He changed the calendar. He's everywhere. He can be found. But if we cross the line, the social line and the spiritual line, we can get to a point in which we cross the line with God. And this is very, very dangerous. Let me just mention two people that crossed the line with God. One was Adam. You know the story of Adam and Eve. He was giving even a mind like no one can imagine. Now talk about a smart person. Adam was uh, able to give names to all the animals and all the plants that existed. So I don't know how, how it, it happened, but you know, he saw a bug and uh, God asked him, so what do you call that one? I call it an ant. <laughs> and he saw another animal, oh that one is a rabbit. And he named all the animals. You know, I can name a few, and I, I know most animals, but some, some animals, I don't even know what they are. And some species, they have different kinds of animals on each species. And he was able to do this. And he was in the garden. And the Bible says in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, The Lord God commanded man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. What happened? He ate. He crossed the line. And God came and said, okay, I'll give you another opportunity. No. He had his opportunity. We have a merciful and loving God. But God was really clear. It was really clear. You have everything for you. Except this tree. And, and you know what? There's so many varieties of trees and bushes and so many things. You know how many thousands of 
and, and, and uh, uh, different trees and vegetables and things we can eat. You know, sometimes I, I travel to other parts of the world and we see those, uh, these fruits, we don't even know what they are, dragon fruit and this and that. Uh, uh, when we went to the, I went to the Amazon with my wife and they had all these kinds of different fruits and we were looking and saying, what is this? <laughs> they were uh, awesome, it's sweet, so good. Why should you eat from that tree that God said no? You know, Adam crossed the line. Because he crossed the line, we suffer the consequences. Another person that crossed the line was King Saul. And I'm not going, again, to read the whole scripture, but what, what uh, happened with King Saul is that he uh, decided to uh, fulfill the role of the priest. You know, certain things were reserved to those that served in the house of God. But King Saul thought, well, why shouldn't I do the same thing as, as the pastor, as the priest? You know, again, he's a man just like me. And so, because of certain circumstances, uh, Saul did something that he shouldn't, that was reserved to the Levites, to the priests. And, and so Samuel went to him, and on verse 11 of 1 Samuel 13, he asked, what have you done? And Saul started to give excuses. Well, I saw people were arriving, and the pastor wasn't here. So I decided to go ahead with the ceremony because, you know, who cares? It's me, them, you know, I can do uh, uh, anything. And Samuel said, you acted foolishly. And because of what you did, you've crossed the line. And you've lost your kingdom. He lost, he lost the kingdom because he crossed a line. And, and you might, might think, well, that, that was really harsh. What is the problem? You know what's the problem of you know doing a religious ceremony? He, wasn't he the king? Yes, he was the king. But even kings have boundaries. There are certain things that kings cannot do. Now, there's a lot of, of abuse in churches. A lot of ministers that abuse churches and abuse people. Some even abuse children. And we we all listen to those, these stories of abuse and we're shocked. And the line was crossed. And you, you don't want to be found in a place where you cross the line with God. Saul, Saul crossed the line and he lost the kingdom. And you know, God doesn't accept that we cross the lines that he established. There's, those are very clear lines. If we, if we were redeemed from sin and we gave our lives to the Lord, your life is not yours. So there's lines we can cross. And I've seen over and over and over again, Christians that cross the line and they do the same thing as Saul. They start to excuse themselves. Oh, there's a reason why I did this. Oh, let me explain. There's a reason why I said this. Like Adam gave excuses, Saul gave excuses. We understand that when we cross the line, the only way of being restored is through repentance. Can you say repentance? I don't know if you ever crossed the line with God, but if you did, there's still hope. There's hope for you. Now, let me go to the next point, and let, let me talk about riding in the sand. And uh, while I was dating my wife, we, we used to go and walk by the ocean. And one of the things that I enjoyed doing was uh, drawing a, a little heart, and my name, and her name, and drawing uh, a, 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 a close to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the ocean. And then the wave would come and just erase everything. Why would we ride in the sand? Why do we do these things? Why do we write in sand? You know, we can draw the line in the sand. We can write in sand. When you write in sand, it's not permanent. It's meant to be read in a, in a short time frame. It's not something that you write in stone. Wind can come and destroy what you wrote, or a wave, or something. It's a temporary visual statement. There's no hopes of keeping that statement for me memory. And I want to mention a story of the Bible when Jesus wrote in sand. And uh, there was a woman caught in the act of adultery. And the story is in John chapter 8. And it takes place on the sandy floors, grounds of the, the, the temple, uh, the main temple. And uh, so we presume the flooring was sand. And the, the Lord Jesus just 
kneeled down, and as they were bringing that woman accused of adultery, he was writing with his finger, and he was writing something uh, in, in, the, in the Sabbath. Now, according to Jewish law, in, on the Sabbath day, you can write not even two letters. But Jewish law says you can write it in, in the dust. It's very interesting to, uh, when we study Jewish law and we try to understand what, what was Jesus doing. And there's been a lot of speculation about what, what Jesus wrote in the sand. And I've read some Bible commentaries that say he was writing the names of the accusers. He was writing those names. He said, okay, that's Joseph and that's uh, <laughs> Moshe and that's uh, Isaac and that's uh, and he was I don't think he was writing about the names I don't know what, what he wrote I like to think that he was uh, writing something more like 1 Samuel 2 8 where it says that he raises up the poor from the dust he leads the needy from the hash heap to make them seek with princes and inherit the seat of honor that's what I like to think that Jesus was writing at, at, at that moment and that's what he did with that woman. Because as, as, as they were telling the Lord, well, the law says that we need to stun this woman to death. So what shall we do? And you know what Jesus did? He said, come, come the first one. The, the one that has no sin, let him through the first stone. And one by one, they just left. And for the second time, the scripture says that he continued to write on the, on, the, on, the, on the sand, in the sand. And as, as he was writing, he told that woman, I don't condemn you either. So go and see him no more. So what happened with this woman? She crossed the line. She crossed the line. Not only in her social relationship with her husband, she committed adultery. But also she crossed the line with God because adultery is considered uh, an offense and a sin in the Old Testament punished by death. So, so she crossed a, a, a line in the family, a religious line, and now she's there with Jesus. But Jesus was able to reverse the situation. And as he was riding in sand, something happened. Her destiny was changed forever. You know, we, we cross lines with people. Sometimes we can even commit a terrible sin something awful and people are willing even our friends and neighbors are willing to cast the stones and just kill us because people are not very merciful people are not very merciful and as they brought the woman to jesus jesus through his writing on in, in, in the sand was able to change the destiny of that woman Amen. you know some people also do little abstract things who absorb ideas. And some people said, well, Jesus was just, you know, drawing something. I don't think he was drawing a happy face <laughs> in, in that situation or, you know, just doodling uh, some uh, abstract uh, things. And uh, there, there's really no record of what happened. But one thing it's mentioned is that he was not only writing in the sand, but he was using his feet. Because when we write in sand, we can use a stick, we can use anything. But he was writing with his finger. And you know, God's finger is very important. Mm -hmm. If you read scripture, the, the, the Ten Commandments were given in tablets. And God wrote in tablets. I was making fun of a pastor because we were comparing his computer with my iPad. And I said, my tablet, my iPad is more biblical. He said, how come? I said, because God wrote in tablets. <laughs> Just, uh, and, but, but God wrote in tablets, and He wrote with His own finger. And as, he, as Jesus was there, just writing in the sand, something happened to the destiny of that woman. And it doesn't matter who you are, the sin you've committed. People can be willing to kill you and just to destroy your life. But there's still hope. Amen. Because when Jesus writes in the sand, the destiny of your life can be changed Amen. forevermore. Amen. That's why we have drug addicts that become pastors. That's why we have people that were alcoholic and that they, people who 
just say you're, you're good for nothing and now they're very successful people because when you place your hand your life in the hands of Jesus he's willing to write down another chapter of your life so uh, as, as I want to come to the last uh, point of my message uh, I want to mention uh, a story that I was uh, reading uh, in a book by Pastor Mark uh, Patterson very interesting book that I, I really recommend it's called Circle Maker. It's a book on prayer. And this book starts with an illustration. It talks about uh, a tale, a Jewish uh, tale from the Talmud. And it's the, the legend of, of Honi, the, the Circle Maker. And according to Jewish tradition, uh, a generation just before Jesus was born, there was a great drop in the, in the land uh, of uh, Israel. And uh, uh, people were being destroyed. The generation was literally uh, threatened to die because there was no food in the land. The animals were dying. There was no vegetation, and uh, and uh, miracles were just a memory for four, for uh, three hundred years. And, and so there was no prophecy. There were no prophets. People couldn't hear from God. But there was this uh, this man, and uh, uh, he was a, a scholar, a teacher. And his name was uh, Oni, and uh, as people were just crying and just cursing God, he got his rod and he drew a circle in the sand. And, uh, and uh, after uh, he did the circle, he kneeled down and he told everybody, I will not believe this circle until God answers my prayer. And according to the Jewish legend, he started praying and raised his hands to heaven. And uh, with the authority, like the pro prophet Elijah, he prayed for rain. And suddenly there was a mist in the air, and uh, and some some uh, and the, the, the sprinkle started to come, and people were rejoicing as he was praying. But he didn't stop. He said, "Lord, this is not the rain that I'm asking." He, he, he said, "Lord of, of the universe." I swear before your great name, I will not move from this circle until you show mercy to your to your people. And as 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 uh, and he was praying, he said, "Not for such rain I have prayed, but rain that will fill cisterns, pits, and caverns." And there was an outpouring of rain. It was so heavy that people had to go up to the mountains to escape the flooding of that rain. And honey still remained in the circle. And then he said, "Lord." This is a bit too much. <laughs> and he continued his prayer. And he, and he said, Nor for such rain I have prayed, but for rain also of benevolence, benediction, and grace. And right after this happened, uh, there, there was a, a gathering of, uh, of religious people, and they, they decided to expel him from the Sinedrium because uh, they, they said it was too much what he did. It was... Uh, it wasn't the, the right way to pray, and so all the religious people were very upset with with Hardy. And uh, it's a very interesting story. So Pastor uh, Patterson did this book on prayer, and uh, and uh, I like to mention this aspect of prayer, of drawing in the sand, an imaginary line, drawing something in our lives, and tell the Lord, telling the Lord, Lord, I will not leave this place until you bless me. I will not leave this circle until you pass it. You see, writing in sand, it's very important. First, we started by understanding the social boundaries and when we draw lines and the, the drawing of, line, of a line in the sand to separate from uh, what is our territory and another territory. And we can cross the line with people. Often, as a pastor, I would tell if someone crosses the line, I'll tell that person, you've crossed the line. You went beyond what you should do. That's my role. That's why I'm here. I'm not here just to preach. I'm here if, you know, to tell you when, when there's a danger of doing something that can not only be bad in, in social terms, but it can be terrible when you cross the line before the Lord. When you cross the line with God, sometimes there's no, no way back. There are situations, there's no way back. You know, even Jesus said, any offense can be forgiven. An offense against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Have you ever read this? 
How can you offend the Holy Spirit? You can't offend the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be in a position in which I offend the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, even if you cross the line with people, even if you cross the line with God, Jesus is still merciful to write him in the sand and to say, okay, you're guilty, but you know what? I'm here to lift you up from the sand. I'm here to lift you up to a position different from the one you have. And as we conclude today, let me tell you that we need a shower of blessing in our lives. And I've mentioned how we need this shower of blessing. Maybe you're going through a period of drought and you're thinking, what did I do? What happened? Why am I going through these trials? Why am I going through these difficulties? Why am I suffering so much? Maybe it's time for you to ask for forgiveness, to repent, and to draw your own line in the sand. And to say, Lord, I will not move until you bless me. I will not do anything until you bless me. And uh, we need to learn how to pray like Harlem. And to, today, I'd like to challenge you to draw your line in the sand. Draw your line in terms of prayer. I want to encourage you also, if you know that you've crossed the line and you've messed up, certain times we do things that, 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 that we, we thought they were not inside of us to do. But we've said things, we did things, and we repent. It's not enough just to feel sorry for what we did. We need to do a step, go a step further and kneel before the Lord and just wait that Jesus with His finger starts right now a new chapter of our life. Oh, how I want to ask the Lord, Lord, what, what were you writing when they brought that woman to you? What, what, was, what was the thing? What were you doing? I would like to know. So I don't know. I cannot tell you that he was writing that psalm or whatever he was writing, but I know something. That his finger, the authority of God, is able to write a new chapter of our lives. Let us all stand and we're going to finish with the word of prayer.